Harry Potter. What's up guys? This is a very different video than I normally do. Obviously, I'm um, in front of the camera and uh, this is my sister Hannah. Hello. We are both huge Harry Potter fans and uh, we went to see the Cursed Child play. Now, obviously, you guys know how I felt about that script. It was terrible. I have been carefully avoiding reading the book and reading any reviews or even watching your video so that I could have a completely fresh point of view. Yeah, so I dissected the book so I know everything about it. She has no idea about anything. I think the only thing you knew was about Voldemort's daughter, right? I didn't even think that that was true. But, yeah. I heard I heard that there was something about Voldemort having a kid and so then when the when immediately we heard about the Scorpius rumors, I was like, "Oh, that's that." So basically right now, we're just going to review what we thought of the play. Ernest. Yo, we are here in New York. We're about to see the cursed child. I'm here with my sister Hannah. We're both huge Harry Potter fans. Huge. So the play was in two parts and each one was about two and a half hours. It was much longer than I thought it would be. So altogether it was about five hours. So what did you think of the play knowing nothing about it? Having never read it before, but hearing everything about it, because I mean, try as I might, I, I heard that people had problems with the script. I was not expecting to enjoy the story so much. I really liked the story, despite despite some like minor loose parts in the plot. I thought it was absolutely exciting and it felt a lot like the Harry Potter books that we know and love. Yeah, so I agree with that. It was a lot better than the script. Obviously, Harry Harry Potter movies, books, like all of it always has that magical feeling to it. And this play definitely showed that. We're in line right now. I'm so excited. I'm actually wearing the shirt I got at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. I'm about to buy this shirt. I absolutely hated the script. You all know that from that video. But I am very excited to see what they have. I'm, I'm open-minded. I am very interested to see, like, Harry Potter always is very fantastic and, like, very good show-wise and, like, visually. So, like, that's what I'm expecting from this play. But like, I just know that the story is absolute crap. But it'll be interesting to see if our uh, expectations are met. So you can see our view from uh, where we're sitting. The way that the light comes in is magnificent. And uh... Your movie buff is showing. <laughs> what do you think that's a stage of? Like, what do you think that scene is? I have no idea. I have no clue what this is about. There's a lot of luggage. So maybe they're gonna go on the Hogwarts Express. There you go, there you go. Hey, really? Yeah. Nice. It picks up right at the epilogue. Oh my gosh, I love that. Albus Severus Potter. You were named after two headmasters of Hogwarts. One of them was a Slytherin, and he was the bravest man I've ever known. Okay, so the play was better than the script, obviously, because the play had everything that the script had, plus so much more. The script was an element of the play. So the comparison of reading the books versus reading the script is not really that fair because it is a script. It's not meant to stand on its own. Yeah, that's definitely true. And when I was reading the script, there were many things that I didn't think were funny. But once I saw it in the play, there were so many funny moments. It, the actors had a huge part in that. They weren't funny when it was me thinking of it while I was reading. The words alone were not necessarily that funny, but the way they were delivered was hilarious. One of my favorite parts was when Albus was Ron in the Ministry of Magic and uh, he had to talk to Hermione and Harry. And he said, uh, I want to go on a trip or have a baby. Oh my gosh, he <laughs> panicked. And I remember like just the, the physical acting was great. Uh, she was about to go into her office where uh, Delphi and Scorpius were. And he kind of went, like covered it with his uh, <laughs> cloak. It was good that they got somebody for Ron that was such a good physical actor because he didn't have a lot of lines and because in the movies, Rupert was just, had such amazing facial expressions. I felt like a yeah. lot of, um, bringing Ron to life was nonverbal, 
in the movies as it was in the play. When you're talking about Ron standing in front of the door and how funny that was, I thought you were gonna say when Hermione then came back and clarified and was like, okay, so you want a baby or a holiday. <laughs> that was what I thought was so much funnier than when yeah. he said it. it, was her reaction to it. Speaking about Hermione and Ron, I didn't tell you any of this because I didn't wanna skew your uh, view of Ron when you went to the play, but I think that he is still so different than how he is in the books and movies. Ron was not, Ron was not one who was a funny guy and you will see that Ron was actually very serious. Uh, war really affected him. Losing his brother really affected him. So he was very traumatized by war, by the Battle of Hogwarts. And in the play, he is nothing but a jokester. As I said in my review of the script, uh, they say Ron will be Ron, but that's not Ron. Plus, Ron was, he was a serious, person for the most part I guess compared to Fred and George in that he didn't crack jokes but he was always funny he was sort of I don't know he was kind of a mean sort of funny he was, he was more yeah. snarky Fred and George would be the ones making the jokes and then Ron would be the one saying something under his breath that was like quietly hilarious and a little bit rude so it's that not that true. he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't a jokester, but he was always, he always enjoyed humor. I see why they had to make Ron so much of a jokester though, because they needed that strong juxtaposition between Ron and the original interpretation of the Wizarding World versus the very serious, very refined version of Ron who married Padma. Yeah, that's true. They did have to kind of exaggerate him in the beginning to make sure that you saw the difference in him uh, when time was changed. So yeah, I definitely get what you're saying. Hermione, yeah, can we talk about Hermione and how much I love Hermione? <laughs> <laughs> she was so well cast. I liked the, I liked when Hermione said, I'm not gonna Cornelius fudge this, Harry. I'm not gonna stick my head in the sand. One, because I was like, you go girl. Like, yes, that's how the Minister for Magic should be. And also because like any jab we can throw at fudge, yeah. let's do it. I also did not realize that fudge sounds a lot like, I don't know if I can say this in your video. Yeah, fudge means f <laughs> Who would have known? Now that, okay, now that I see it, it's really obvious, but. He's also a up. I see you rolling. That's what I'm saying. He's fuck up. He's such a fuck. So the entire play itself was a spectacle to watch. There wasn't a lot of dancing per se, but there was a lot of extremely well choreographed movement. And the wands. They, they did that for multiple things. They did that for like the classroom scene where Albus couldn't keep up and like he was out of sync with everybody else. The effect of all of the wands moving together was so well done. And uh, the the effects were outstanding. There was one effect that uh, both of us really liked. We oh said my this. Gosh. It was like womp, womp, womp. It looked like sound waves were like woo, woo, woo. I, it was so cool. I still don't know how they did it. Whatever the, they did, they did it well. The lighting always uh, played a big part in the effects. Like there was one with the telephone booth. And obviously that's how you enter the Ministry of Magic. We saw Harry do that in the Order of the Phoenix. And here we saw Harry get sucked in. It was it was so cool. Like I know how they did it. They had like a wall of light. But even still, like with the sound effect and then uh, the actor like getting sucked in, like jumping in. It really looked like he was being like, yeah, like swallowed yeah. by this little hole. It was so cool. And probably my favorite part of this whole thing were uh, things that weren't actually on the stage. It was two things that were out with the audience. The first oh one gosh. was uh, the Dementors. They kind of... felt exactly the way I would have expected them to. Yeah. The way they were sort of floating, they were shadowy and they were elusive. They felt like something more than smoke but less than matter. And like, and then... I remember we were like really close up to uh, the banister and then they were getting in our face, like coming close to us. And my heart was beating, especially with the music going. I wish that they had done something with air conditioning to make it chilly. If they had done like wind, that would, that would be have cool. been so cool. cool yeah. A cool breeze. That would have been very cool. I don't know if that's even possible in such a big room, but I wouldn't have thought that a lot of what they did was possible and they made it look spectacular. There was 
fire and there was water and the other thing I was talking about in the crowd it was when Harry Hermione Ron and Draco all found out about Delphi being Voldemort's daughter and the walls all around you the whole like room every wall was filled with graffiti written by Delphi that was so cool it was every part of the walls and the ceiling and there are a lot of small parts with the prophecy written on it and it was so funny that then during intermission and even before part two you could see people everywhere coming up with their phones and black lights trying to look really closely at the walls to see like how was it projected it? Yeah. there was it painted with something glow in the dark I don't know how they did it but we were not the only people perplexed everybody was trying to figure that out in there. Yeah. Another one of the effects that I thought they did really well was the flu network. The fire would be there, then they would slide down, and like right when they were like right here on the slide, the fire would go out, and then they come out, and then the fire would go back up. Was that up. real fire? It looked real. We're at intermission. What do you think so far? I like it so far. I don't understand why everybody's so upset with this. I mean, I understand it a little bit. I felt like Draco was exactly the way he would be as an adult. Um, I love the fact that Hermione locks things up with riddles in her, in her office because she said in the first book that some of the greatest wizards have an ounce of logic. Who's your favorite character so far? Initially I want to say Rose just because she cracks me up and I feel like that's exactly the way Hermione's daughter would be. But there's something terribly endearing about Scorpius. He makes me so sad and he's so hilariously awkward when he was trying to when he was talking about bread, he, he was trying to compliment uh, yeah, that Rose. Funny. So let's talk about Scorpius. As I said in my review, out of all of the new characters, he was by far the most relatable and my favorite. When I read the script, I imagined his voice very differently. I expected it to be like a level-headed, normal, more like Draco and Lucius voice. Lucius Malfoy. But in this play, it was very squeaky and was, awkward and loud. It was almost squealy. He would start talking and then get really quiet because he'd realize that he started really loud and then he would have to pull back and he would be really insecure about what he was saying and so he would talk like this and he would get really <sighs> Which was so different than his father who just like in the movies and the books was very calm, cool, and collected. Exactly. And Everything about his voice screamed insecurity. I'm sure that a lot of thought went into how his voice should be, which obviously it didn't come out in the script when I was reading it because that's something that the director and the actors do. So I missed that when I was reading the script. So I think that adds a lot to it and makes me like it a lot more, actually. Things at Hogwarts are far worse than I feared. Umbridge coming back was 100% worse than Voldemort Day. Yeah, and that was I was where... more shook about her saying I'm the headmistress than about Voldemort Day, which is saying a lot because that was a really dramatic moment. And that was the end of part one. That was a lot. It was like... So, yeah, leaving the theater after that, everybody... Like, I already knew what was going to happen, but I just remember everyone else being like... We were shook. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were shook. There was so much that happened in that last, like... 30 seconds. It was like, boom, Albus is dead. Boom, Harry Potter's dead. Boom, Umbridge is back. Boom, Voldemort day. Goodbye, intermission. Or not even intermission. Goodbye, go find something to do in New York for a couple hours. And everybody walked out of there like, oh my God. We're in line for part two. Let's go, part two. We're waiting for the doors to open. It's Voldemort day, baby. So uh, let's talk about Harry. As I said in my review for the book, I did not think that this was the Harry that was in the books or movies, just like Ron, but I think that they were even more unfaithful to him in this play, mainly because he's always talking about his fame. He is so focused on himself. I don't think it's that he always wanted to talk about himself. I think it's that he was so used to being Harry Potter, which came with some responsibilities. He was just sort of always in the mindset that people were looking at him not as Albus's father or as Ginny's husband or even necessarily as a politician, but as Harry Potter, the boy who lived. And there is a line that he, that I found so heartbreaking where I believe the exact words don't, Please don't fact check me on this, but I believe it was how many people have to die for, for the, the boy, boy who, who lived. lived. Yeah. And that line was delivered with such pain. 
actually when I read that, uh, I did say that that was one of my favorite lines of the book, and I think that that part was great. And actually in the play, I think that they did that even better. He was literally broken, crying on Ginny's shoulder. It was a really eye-opening moment, and it really made you feel for Harry. Again, that's credit to the actors. It was... It's a credit to the actors, but I also think that it was just a really good line. It was just a line that held so much of the character in it. It reminded me a lot also of when later in part two, when Albus was saying, Harry said, you really saved us, Albus. And Albus said, well, couldn't couldn't I have saved us better? Because there was a casualty, an innocent casualty. And Harry said, don't you think that I've thought that all the time that was a good look into like his thought process you know he won the war he beat Voldemort but there's always that feeling inside of him that if he had ended it earlier fewer people would have died that guilt and that worry and the focus on couldn't I have done it better none of it made any difference didn't make any difference Harry it made all the difference in the world so let's talk about Ginny there was one moment where um, Ginny was being very rational and calm, even though her child was missing. And uh, Draco blew up and yelled, my son is missing. And she turned around and absolutely came back at him with so much power and so much emotion saying, so is mine. And that just felt so true to who Ginny was. And it also reminded me so much of Molly. I felt very, exactly, not my daughter, you bitch. It felt just like that. Not my daughter, you bitch. (laughs) So I know that you had a problem with the sorting hat. Yeah, it wasn't the sorting hat. Why would they have a bowler hat like that? Is that an allusion to Fudge? Because I didn't like him. One thing I was really surprised about was that they didn't use the Harry Potter soundtrack from the movies. Like, they use it in Fantastic Beasts. Like, as soon as the title comes up, it's the Harry Potter theme. And they didn't do that here. It was a great soundtrack, but I was just very surprised that they didn't use the Harry Potter soundtrack. I was also surprised. It felt like... The Harry Potter soundtrack is sort of a theme song, and in this, a lot of the music still managed to be beautiful, especially during the transitions. But I agree, I was disappointed we didn't get the... (laughs) You know? The one thing that really bothered me was, why was Snape alive? Yes. When, why would Snape be alive because Cedric was... Death Eater. Everything that happened to Voldemort and Snape and Dumbledore still happened even though Cedric's a Death Eater. So there's no reason why he should be alive, but I'm not gonna lie, I did really like him in the play. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Like, you shouldn't be here, but I'm glad that you showed up. Okay, can we please talk about Moaning Myrtle? Oh yes, I forgot about Moaning Myrtle. So well cast, the lines were perfect, everything about it was perfect. I loved the way they did that whole bathroom scene. The set was absolutely fantastic because it gave Myrtle the ability to sit on the sink and look like, almost like she was floating like a ghost and then also spin around because she was in constant motion. She delivered her lines perfectly. Like she would be like, Harry. Yeah. It was so, yes, it was hilarious. That was, yeah, she delivered her lines perfectly. And the choreography that she had with uh, the spinning sink, which is the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets, was amazing. And, like, she did some pretty impressive stuff, like hanging upside down and then, like, shooting around and still spinning. Like, oh, yeah. I was impressed. It looked, like, fun. I wanted to play on it. So what did you think about Delphi being Voldemort's daughter? Okay, um, part one... I was really I was really disappointed about it because part one gave me serious golden trio vibes with yeah. Delphi, Scorpius, and Albus. What did you think about Voldemort and Bellatrix making uh, her? Uh, <laughs> uh, I yeah. hate that. So one of my favorite parts of the play when I read the book was the dream scene where Petunia takes Harry to the graveyard and Harry says they didn't have any friends and then Petunia says no they didn't. He said why are there so many flowers here then? What did you think of that whole scene? I thought it was fit so well in the play and it fits so well also with the original stories. It's even yeah. though that didn't happen in the books, you could absolutely see that happening because there was just enough good in Petunia and just enough caring about her family to take Harry there, but she was not going to say a single nice thing about her sister yeah. and she was not going to admit anything to Harry. And that for me was the defining moment of Petunia as a character overall. In that moment, I was like, yep, they did this correctly. What about the other 
dream scene, the other graveyard scene where Voldemort's hand came out and grabbed it. Yo, that scared the crap out of everyone in the theater. I was like, like I don't jump normally. And this, yo, I jumped out of my, like my butt was two inches above the seat. <laughs> like it was it was scary. All right, that about does it. Thank you so much for watching guys. Can I say it? Yeah. Thank you so much for watching guys. Look out for more great videos. Is that it? That's it. That's, yeah, that's, that's close. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching guys. You can follow me on social media. Links for that will be in the description. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in my next video, go ahead and check out my Patreon. If you like this video, make sure you press that subscribe button. Again, thank you so much for watching, and look out for more great videos on the way.